Welcome to this webinar. Before we begin the presentation, I want to provide you with a few housekeeping items. On your screen, you will see a taskbar with icons. Each icon is assigned to a particular element of today's webinar. Click on the person icon to learn more about today's speakers. Throughout the presentation, you can network with others or submit questions to the speakers in the Q&A and chat box next to the slides. Download resources from the cloud icon. After the webinar is over, please take our survey to tell us how we did. Today's event is being recorded and archived and will be available within 24 hours. For on-demand questions or comments, send us an email by clicking Need Help? Email us. If you experience any technical issues today, please refresh your browser by hitting F5 for PC or Command R for Mac. And now I'm excited to turn it over to today's moderator. Good afternoon, and welcome to this webinar, How to Successfully Deploy Lithium-Ion UPSs by Navigating the Latest Trends and Requirements. This event, brought to you by Mission Critical, is sponsored by Eaton. I'm your moderator, Amy Alcatiz, Editor-in-Chief of Mission Critical. Thank you for joining us. Today's presenter is Ed Spears, Product Marketing Manager for Eaton's Critical Power Solutions Division. A 35-year veteran of the power systems industry, Ed has experience in UPS systems testing, sales applications engineering, and training, as well as working in power quality engineering and marketing for telecommunications, data centers, cable television, and broadband public networks. Don't forget to submit your questions, and later in the program, we will address as many as possible. And now I'm excited to turn it over to Mr. Ed Spears. Thank you, Amy, and uh, welcome everyone to our little discussion on lithium ion battery installations with UPS. Uh, we're gonna cover a fair amount of information here, so jot down your questions and make sure you take the opportunity to ask them when we uh, get towards the end of the presentation. Uh, what we'll be covering today is a little bit of uh, probably a review for many of you uh, uh, what's new in lithium-ion battery technology, benefits and features of typical lithium battery installations. Uh, the more important part here is how to properly plan a successful lithium-ion UPS installation and how to navigate the uh, forest of industry trends and code requirements and things like that. This is a new technology for a lot of us, and including the uh, regulatory uh, agencies and uh, uh, the code uh, uh, folks that make the uh, uh, electrical and fire codes. So uh, we're all uh, learning together and uh, the more experience we have and more information we have, the better likelihood of success. So let's go right in here. Uh, the uh, lithium batteries have gone from being a not viable uh, solution for large UPS applications to being one of the most common battery solutions over the course of just a few years. If you look way back in time, you know that uh, lead acid batteries have been used and in fact are ideal for uh, uninterruptible power supply applications uh, uh, from the standpoint of performance and cost and reliability. Their size and weight and acid electrolyte and things like that have posed a bit of a challenge, but up until very recently, they were far and away the best uh, cost per minute of backup time for UPS applications. That's changed in the last three to four years with the advent of modern large format lithium ion batteries that are ideal for use with UPS systems. So that's what we'll be talking about primarily today. If we look at uh, lithium ion versus traditional valve regulated lead acid uh, benefits uh, comparatively, one of the big things that I think everyone knows about is the smaller size and lighter weight of uh, lithium batteries versus traditional UPS batteries is quite obvious. We show here three options on the right hand side of the slide. There's a traditional UPS battery cabinet uh, and a couple of uh, different lithium uh, battery cabinets available from a variety of vendors now for UPS application. But if you look at the bottom of each little uh, uh, rectangle there, the uh, orange one and the two green ones, you see the traditional battery cabinet, uh, about 33 kilowatt hours capacity, the same as the other ones on this page. Its weight is about 4,800 pounds, almost 5,000 pounds. 
And uh, the physical footprint of this battery cabinet's about 30 inches wide, about 42 inches deep. So it weighs uh, quite a bit. It's a pretty uh, heavy duty battery there. And many UPSs use multiple of these cabinets. If I contrast that with a lithium battery, I see for the same amount of kilowatt hours or the same backup time capacity, I see the weight drops from 4,800 down to 1,200 pounds looking at the center cabinet here. And the footprint of that cabinet is only about two feet by two feet for the same amount of backup time. So you can see the footprint comparison on the left-hand side of the slide is significant uh, benefit there. But there's other things too besides size and weight. Uh, the battery management system, or BMS, that we'll be talking about several instances during this presentation is always included, in fact, required to be included uh, in a lithium system. Uh, the uh, uh, longer warranty and service life uh, for uh, lithium batteries versus traditional UPS batteries is roughly double uh, what we're used to with, uh, with uh, the kind of batteries we've been dealing with for the last decades. And in some cases, a higher operating temperature can be achieved without damage to the battery. We have to be careful with that. But in general, you're going to get better high temperature and low temperature performance from a lithium battery than you do from a traditional UPS battery. So these are the kind of things that are driving our client base in the UPS industry, mostly data centers, but other types of critical power protection, medical imaging, uh, factory floor automation, that kind of thing. We are seeing... Uh, rapid increase in uptake in the last couple of years to where almost 30% of our new installations uh, are now being supplied with lithium batteries for uh, mid to large size UPS. So the applications where this type of battery are ideal are, of course, where size and weight are important. Any place where you have a restriction in space, a mobile application, outdoor application, something like that. Any application that requires battery monitoring slash management, in other words, I need to be able to tell remotely what's going on with that battery, and ideally, I'd like my monitoring management system to be able to take action if necessary for safety reasons, for example, independently of my own control. Uh, so any installation that requires uh, detailed battery monitoring and management is ideal for lithium since they come with that feature built in and any application where you may have a high cycle count. In other words, a large amount of charges and discharges uh, uh, in the uh, uh, battery uh, and where the long service life is important. And in general, long service life is a good thing. Everyone can understand getting more uh, bang for your buck in terms of how long the battery lasts. But a high cycle count application might be one where the battery system and the UPS are being used for energy and management features uh, for a facility like peak shaving, uh, time of use rates, uh, uh, those types of capabilities which provide uh, an additional uh, monetization of your investment in these large UPSs and batteries. And one of the downsides to that traditionally was it required the battery to charge and discharge so frequently that it wore the battery out. And uh, lithium batteries are especially uh, good in handling that type of environment. So those are some ideal applications. I would note in the next slide here that uh, lithium ion batteries are not all the same. Specifically, they're not the same as the battery that you would use in your cell phone or your laptop, for example. And so uh, this slide shows on the left-hand side some comparisons of different lithium chemistries. And by the way, this information comes from a source called a website called batteryuniversity.com. And I'd recommend taking a look there to get a good unbiased view at the different uh, battery technologies, including the different kinds of lithium. And uh, they show some graphs that compare performance. In the upper left-hand corner of the slide, you see lithium iron phosphate chemistry has the advantage of being one of the safest chemistries out there. Uh, in terms of thermal performance and stability, et cetera, whereas the graph in the lower right-hand corner, the lithium cobalt oxide, uh, uh, generally has uh, less of a good safety profile, but is ideal for applications where you need to pack a small battery in a small space, like a cell phone or a laptop. The other two chemistries shown compare their performance over things like specific energy and specific power. Now, those two features sound like the same thing, but specific energy, a battery that's high in specific energy, has increased capacity compared to other choices that relates to backup time. So high specific energy means longer backup time. 
On the other hand, high specific power talks to the ability for that battery to dump its energy out quickly at a very intense rate. So if I have an application where I just need two or three minutes or even one minute of battery backup, a high specific power battery would be ideal. If I need a more traditional UPS application with 5, 10, 15, even 30 minutes of backup time, high specific energy is desired. Uh, they also compare performance at hot and cold temperatures and the expected lifetime, reflecting how many charge discharge cycles they can handle and still last uh, full 10 years. So this is just a quick comparison of the different chemistries that are available. And the ones that we would choose uh, for UPSs are going to be the ones that have the, uh, the higher specific energy and the longer service life. So let's move along here and talk about safety. Anybody that's considered lithium batteries and recognizes that the battery in your cell phone weighs four ounces and a cabinet full of lithium batteries weighs a little over a thousand pounds, then there is a concern about thermal performance and safety. So the three main reasons that we in the industry are comfortable with battery safety have to do with the battery management system that's built into every lithium battery uh, system. Uh, which will take action independently to protect the battery uh, and the uh, facility. Uh, there's also the choice of the safest lithium-ion chemistry that we saw on the previous slide. The last thing, number three on the left-hand side there, is that the systems, the lithium battery systems and their enclosures and their packaging are designed thermally to release heat faster than it can build up. In other words, even if the battery is being abused, abused by overcharge or over discharge, the system is designed to throw off heat faster than it can build up, almost completely precluding any possibility of a thermal runaway condition. So that's always a good feature to see in the design. Now, it's nice to give three main reasons, but there's also a regulatory compliance that uh, most lithium ion battery systems comply with. On the right hand side in the box there, you see UL1642, which is a standard for the lithium ion battery cells themselves. UL1973 is a standard for uh, lithium battery systems or batteries that are used in stationary applications uh, and tied together in a series string like we would typically see with the UPS battery. UL1998 is incorporated by reference into UL1973 and concerns the software programmable components, that is, the battery management system. UL991 is a standard for tests. UL9540A is not a UL listing. It's actually a test method, and we'll be talking a lot more about that as we go here. The last one shown is not UL, but UN, as in United Nations, Section 38.3, which has to do with uh, global standards and requirements for packaging and labeling these batteries, and also, for example, for the labeling that must be on the truck that delivers batteries to your facility. Uh, the good news is that is a global standard, so it's going to be the same uh, requirements no matter where your battery uh, is shipped. Okay, so let's uh, uh, move on to the planning process here. And the planning for a lithium-ion battery installation begins at the system design stage, definitely not after you've already purchased your system or on the installation day. We want to do this planning at the system design stage because... Many aspects of a deployment are governed by building codes, for example, IBC 509, International Building Code. Uh, fire codes, IFC 1206, if you've been around batteries for a while, you may well remember IFC 608, uh, which is being replaced by IFC 1206 for these types of battery installations, and we'll talk much more about that. There's also NFPA 855. Both IFC 1206 and NFPA 855 are newer standards with significant attention paid to lithium ion battery installations. So if your city or state or county or municipality has adopted these newer fire and uh, NFPA uh, or electrical codes, then we will need to comply with those and you need to know that upfront and make plan at the design stage. The new electrical code NEC for 2020 incorporates uh, NFPA 855 as article 855 in the new code. So the question, of course, is which code versions are adopted in my location? Do I need to, uh, to design and implement based on the new codes? Can I use the old code since my city has not adopted the new one yet? And uh, uh, the fact is you can do that, but at some point, particularly if you're planning for future additions to your battery system, 
uh, or adding more UPSs and battery in the same physical room, then you're probably going to want to go ahead and design the entire thing with the newest electrical and fire codes in mind. So the planning will require and address things like the selection and construction of the room where the battery is housed and the location of that room within the building. Uh, there's a significant attention paid to battery cabinet layout and protective spacing between cabinets. There's also a maximum allowable quantity or MAQ of batteries that are allowed in a given environment. And if you're mixing some lithium batteries, and some lead acid batteries and some uh, sodium sulfur batteries or whatever, those maximum allowable quantities can change quite dramatically. And then there's the whole question of addressing fire detection as well as fire suppression. So we'll be looking at that in detail as we go through the rest of the presentation here. Here's a typical lithium ion battery cabinet, also known in the fire code particularly as an array. So they call it an array of batteries. So of course the logical question is, so what's an array? Is it a string? Is it a cabinet? Is it a room? Is it a bunch of cabinets together? And the closest anal analogy there to an array is an actual battery cabinet may contain one string of batteries, might contain more than one string. But if it's an array as defined by the code, each one of those is gonna to need to be less than 50 kilowatt hours of capacity per IFC 1206. So if you have a cabinet that contains more than 50 kilowatt hours worth of battery in that cabinet, then it cannot be uh, defined as an array and may require some special attention uh, or a waiver by the inspector. The good news is that most, uh, Lithium battery cabinets for use with UPSs have a uh, kilowatt hour rating in between about 24 and 35 kilowatt hours. More about that to come. Here's an example of a site drawing provided by a UPS or a battery vendor. And the site drawing is only a couple of pages typically, and it's intended to provide information that allows the designer to plan for the addition of that battery cabinet. Not everything you need to know to install a cabinet that would be in the installation manual. The site planning guide gives you your dimensional information, your weights, details about center of gravity, thermal uh, uh, output, those type of things in one place where you can quickly refer to and get an idea of what this is gonna, gonna look for and what I'm gonna need to do in terms of wiring, both uh, to the UPS and any control wiring that needs to be deployed along with these battery cabinets. So the planning process requires some familiarity with the uh, fire codes and electric codes. So the next uh, section here deals with how do we navigate all these different codes. And you see on the left-hand side of the slide, there's a whole bunch of them. UL 9540 is a test, NFPA 855 and ISC 1206 we already talked about. Uh, UL 1779 is uh, actually a typo, should be UL 1778. I was just checking to make sure you guys were paying attention. UL 1973 uh, or 1073 uh, for, it's actually 1973 for lithium. And the mill standard requirements for doing a failure modes and effect analysis or an FMEA are all going to be things that you might refer to when you're actually planning an installation. Now, we do need to be very clear that uh, ourselves here as a manufacturer of UPS equipment uh, should not be interpreted and acting as the final authority for codes and standards for the end user or their designer. So we don't want to simply absolve ourselves of any responsibility here. We do want to provide some guidance and give the uh, user a heads up into what they're going to need to look out for as they're planning their installation. And that's the purpose of this presentation today. So let's move along here. Let's uh, review the, uh, the key codes and NFPA uh, uh, standards here. NFPA 855 aligns with IFC 1206, the fire code, but uh, while the language is very similar, it's not completely identical. So you'll want to look out for differences uh, sometimes in what's allowed to be accepted to, what can be waived by an inspector and that type of thing. IFC 506 replaces the former IFC 608 for stationary battery uh, installations. And the important thing is it includes a lot more information about how to handle uh, uh, different battery chemistries, particularly lithium. And NFPA 855, again, consolidates the requirement cross-reference between the fire code and the building code and is now in the new latest version of the National Electrical Code is Article 855, 
completed there in its entirety. So those are what we'll be looking at. A little more detail here. The 855 uh, NFPA was approved uh, late in uh, 2019 and does contain requirements with respect to lithium. And of course, what happens here is the municipality or the county or the state that you're deploying in can now determine, of course, when they're going to adopt the new standard. Just because there's a new standard out there doesn't mean that your city will have adopted it. On the other hand, they will eventually because their insurance company will require that. But uh, we see different uh, uh, dates when different states, for example, are going to adopt the latest code. Generally, California, Chicago, New York, uh, sometimes we'll set earlier dates for adoption of the new code, and it's good to know which code is in force uh, as you plan your installation because it may make a significant difference in how you lay things out and uh, the, the actual planning for capacity and that type of thing. So NFPA 855 impacts uh, lithium batteries, and you frequently see the phrase uh, significant uh, restrictions or requirements, quote, unless hazard mitigation and fire testing, UL 9540A test is an example, has been done to the satisfaction of the authority having jurisdiction or the inspector. So NFPA 855 says that our battery arrays can be grouped in maximum 50 kilowatt hour blocks or cabinets and says uh, spaced a minimum of three feet, but there are exceptions to that. The base uh, uh, requirement or the base uh, regulation says cabinets spaced a minimum of three feet apart, which really blows away any footprint advantage that you might have unless you're able to take advantage of the exception, and we'll get to that. Also specifies a maximum allowable quantity in a room of 600 kilowatt hours of batteries. So that means if I have a large room with lots of battery cabinets in there, I want to make sure that I either stay under that 600 kilowatt hour limit or do some expensive things relating to the fire rating and construction of the room in order to not have to meet that uh, maximum. There's also limitations on how far the fire department access my lithium batteries uh, or battery rooms can be in a given building. Now, the bottom of the slide here, we talk about UL 9540A as an Albert. Uh, this is not a listing, doesn't result in a mark on the UPS. It's a test method that is uh, generally used and performed by the folks at UL to evaluate the fire characteristics of the battery energy storage system. What we're looking for is making sure that when we deploy these cabinets in a room, that we're limiting any possible damage or a propagation of a thermal event or a fire. Much more about that coming up. Uh, the test evaluates fire propagation, gas emissions, how much heat is released, and provides a data report that can be given to an authority having jurisdiction or an inspector uh, in conjunction with the facility personnel and facility management for a building to authorize the installed system as safe without having necessarily to conform to things like three foot cabinet spacing and maximum 600 kilowatt hour limitations. So this test is part of a uh, set of documents that can be provided to the authority having jurisdiction so they can make a decision on the uh, acceptability of the installation. <clears throat> a little more detail on the 2018 International Fire Code. This is IFC 1206. There is a, uh, a threshold limit. In other words, does my laptop battery need to comply to the fire code? No, it's too small. Well, how big a battery suddenly comes under the jurisdiction of the fire code? And you can see here, highlighted in blue, for lithium batteries, once you go above 20 kilowatt hours, in an array or cabinet, then you need to comply with the next sections of the code. If you compare that with lead acid batteries just above, you see their threshold quantity is 70 kilowatt hours. So it's a smaller threshold beyond which the lithium battery installations need to comply with the fire code. Now, how many kilowatt hours do I have? Well, in general, a lithium ion battery cabinet, they don't all fit in this window. But in general, they're going to be in a range of 15 to 34 kilowatt hour capacity per cabinet or per array as described in the code. So check with your manufacturer, UPS or battery manufacturer, find out the exact information is also available on those site uh, planning drawings that we saw. Okay, so let's take a look at the uh, following slides. Again, concentrating on the 1206 fire code, uh, you'll find that most of the requirements that affect uh, VRLA, uh, traditional UPS batteries, are gonna be the same for lithium ion battery systems. 
things like seismic requirements, smoke and uh, uh, gas detectors, ventilation for the room, fire suppression capabilities are similar, but they may not be exactly the same. So you do want to get familiar with that. Uh, differences include, for example, the capacity thresholds that we just saw on the previous slide, 20 kilowatt hours for uh, code compliance for lithium versus 70 kilowatt hours for VRLA batteries. Anything above those thresholds, the various code selections are going to apply to those batteries. They consist of things like room location. Our code says uh, lithium battery installation room should not be more than 75 feet above or 30 feet below the fire department access point, which is typically street level. So if you're putting them in the basement or if you're planning to put them on the 35th floor of a skyscraper downtown, you're going to want to need to talk with the authority having jurisdiction about that up front to see if you can get a waiver or you may have to do some redesign. You don't want that to happen later in the uh, process. You want to know that at the design stage. Maximum quantity in a room, we talked about this already, uh, 600 kilowatt hours uh, or more. Uh, 600 kilowatt hours is the limit, and that affects uh, the hazardous occupancy class of the room. So uh, bigger than that, you may be able to go to an H2 hazardous occupancy class, but that means thicker walls, different egress requirements, uh, thicker windows and glass and things like that, which are very expensive. Many customers will elect to arrange their batteries they don't exceed that maximum allowable quantity. UL listings required, we talked about UL 1973 and 1998 earlier, they are required for lithium systems. Battery management system or BMS is required. And there's another one here on electrolyte quantity. You may be familiar with traditional UPS batteries. They talk about a 50 gallon uh, limit for VRLA systems and require spill containment and things like that. Uh, the, uh, lithium batteries don't require spill containment, but if you are greater than a thousand pounds of electrolyte, uh, then you have to go to an incidental use classification for that battery room, which again adds some cost and complexity to the design. Interestingly, even though lithium batteries are electro liquid electrolyte, they do express, uh, express that in pounds rather than gallons. Uh, so typical lithium battery cabinets, uh, just for reference, is going to contain between 100 and 120 pounds of lithium electrolyte. Okay. What about seismic requirements? Well, the battery room in the, uh, uh, in the building is going to have to still, just like it always has, comply with IBC Section 16, IBC 509. And that dictates, you know, how strong to make the building uh, structures itself. It doesn't define the battery cabinet performance in there. So... What we do, just like with valve regulated uh, batteries, is we uh, test them uh, to UBC zone three or four. Uh, Oshpod uh, testing uh, and uh, reports may be available for some cabinet systems. Uh, it's not just for California. We find lots of requests from across the country for uh, cabinetry uh, that it complies with uh, and passes the Oshpod testing. But in the end, the seismic requirements for a lithium installation are not different from that which used for VRLA cabinets. Still looking for a zone three or zone four uh, uh, test uh, passed uh, uh, primarily here. Fire code requirements for the fire rating of the battery room. IBC table 509. Uh, this depends on system electrolyte weight. We talked about that on the previous slide. Greater than 1,000 pounds in one room is going to require an incidental use classification, which costs a little extra money and adds some complexity. The maximum allowable quantity is 600 kilowatt hours. Notice that the authority can waive this for the code based on air testing, which is UL 9540A, and, and a failure modes and effective analysis of the site or of the installation environment. So those two things are key to allow the authority having jurisdiction to waive maximum allowable quantities or cabinet spacing. And we'll talk more about that as we go. We said uh, down at the very bottom of the slide here, typical UPS lithium battery cabinets are about 25 to 35 kilowatt hours each. So installations, just as an example of greater than 18 cabinets in a given room might exceed that 600 kilowatt hour maximum allowable quantity and uh, needs to be uh, considered and discussed with the authority before uh, installation day. Okay, fire detection and suppression, huge topic here. I'll try to cover each of the little items on this slide without uh, uh, 
uh, going into too much excruciating detail. It is definitely true that overheated batteries can produce gases from melting plastic, whether it's a valve-regulated lead-acid battery or a flooded battery or a lithium-ion battery. The cases are made of similar materials, and if there is a fire or extreme overtemperature condition, there's ga gases that can be emitted by those case materials, and we would want to treat them and handle them the same way for lithium as we do for VRLA batteries. In many cases, that means a gas detector, uh, similar to what would be used in a VRLA installation, are required. And these gas detectors may detect single gases, but more likely they uh, are designed to detect a multiple of different gases and their levels and provide alarming information if that happens. <clears throat> Generally, we don't want flammable gases, uh, for example, to exceed 25% of the LFL or lower flammability limit for that particular gas. Now, sprinkler systems. These are water-based systems, and they are required in this kind of application. Typically, the code says about uh, 0.3 gallons per minute per square foot are required, and that's described in an FPA 13 in the fire code section 903. In general, though, for lithium installations, water, and lots of it, is the required and recommended fire suppressant per code. Doesn't mean we can't use other things, but a sprinkler system is going to be required unless you get an exemption. Generally, you're going to have a sprinkler system anyway, and the thing to look for is the ability to provide lots of water if necessary, because it's the most effective uh, lithium battery fire suppressant. So if you're in a skyscraper, for example, in New York City, where you have a cistern on top of the building, and it may contain two or 3,000 gallons of immediately available water dedicated to that building, just keep in mind, it may take more than that, depending on the size of that battery room, the number of battery cabinets in there. So that does need to be considered. Now, we recommend, and as vendors, we provide the material safety data sheets or the safety data sheets, SDS, from the battery manufacturer to provide instructions for those folks that are actively suppressing the fire. In other words, the firefighters and the folks that are entering the building under this condition, the safety data sheet will provide detailed information about the materials that will be involved and uh, how to uh, handle them and what kind of PPE everybody knows today, what PPE stands for, didn't used to, but now we do, what PPE will be required. Now, what about clean gaseous systems like Novec 1230, FM200, and even CO2? These extinguishing systems are definitely allowed, but they're generally used to extinguish fires in non-water resistant. Uh, equipment rooms, for example, the battery may be co-located with uh, $400,000 worth of switch gear, and I don't want to dump thousands of gallons into that if I can avoid it. And NFPA does allow that, but you want to keep in mind that uh, these gaseous systems, these clean systems are generally intended to smother the fire so that it can't get oxygen and the fire goes out. That's the way they've been used uh, for, uh, for many decades. But in a lithium battery fire, some lithium battery chemistry generate their own oxygen while they're burning. So smothering them will eventually allow the battery to go out, but not as quickly as using lots and lots of water. ABC type fire uh, extinguishers are okay if the fire has not originated in or spread to the battery itself. So if there's a fire elsewhere in the room, ABC uh, fire extinguishers work fine. Uh, you can also direct them on the battery itself with no damage. Note that class D fire extinguishers and the special training that goes along with that is not required for lithium installations in any code that we've seen so far. Remember, there are local codes that can supersede the national codes. Additionally, and lastly, Water may be used to cool the battery and other systems in the same room, even if they're not uh, physically burning, but they're in a situation where they are getting too warm and they simply need to be cooled off. Ventilation for both the cabinet and the room. Convection cooling is acceptable in the battery cabinet, providing that the maximum gassing is limited to less than 25% of the lower flammability limit, LFL, of that battery. Depending on how that, uh, the size of the room, ceiling, et cetera, the volume of the room, uh, may require room ventilation or fans to uh, move the uh, air within the room and remove uh, those gases. So uh, uh, ventilation fans and things like that will be dictated by the information safety data sheet and the information available from the uh, uh, volume of the room. Smoke detectors are required, just like with valve-regulated uh, batteries. 
gas detectors, again, just like VRLA batteries, that can automatically do things like start the room fans uh, if they're off or stop charging from the UPS if they detect a certain level of gas. Now, keep in mind that the above are not different than what's required for traditional UPS batteries, but also remember that this is a new technology for ourselves, the users, and the fire code inspectors and electrical code inspectors, so they may be looking very careful at this to make sure that uh, these requirements are met. Okay, this is an important one here, battery cabinet or battery array placement. Per Section 1206, it's also repeated in NFPA 855. Uh, the cabinets uh, should be within 10 feet of the UPS they're supporting if they're in an occupied workspace. And that's sometimes the case, but typically for larger UPS systems, you're going to be in an equipment room or a basement or an area where uh, authorized access is restricted, so you don't have to maintain the 10 feet uh, uh, within our, our length to the uh, our space between the battery and the UPS. But if it's an occupied workspace, the 10 foot rule applies. Uh, applies. <clears throat> now, the spacing of the cabinet. The base language of IFC 1206 and NFPA 855 requires three foot spacing on all sides front, right side, back side, left side. So that really means there's a lot of spacing around those cabinets. And if you have multiple cabinets, that would dictate that you cannot install these cabinets the way you see in the graphic in the lower right-hand corner of this slide. Now, this uh, spacing requirement does apply to UPS battery installations as long as you're over 20 kilowatt hours, and the typical battery cabinet is. So how do I get around this? It absolutely blows away any possible footprint advantage that we would get with lithium batteries. So there is an exception right below that in the code that says if the battery cabinet is tested for large-scale flame propagation, i.e. tested, for example, by uh, UL to the 9540A test standard, then the three-foot spacing may not be required and may be waived by the AHJ. It's not automatic. It's up to the authority having jurisdiction. The AHJ makes this call based on his or her evaluation of those test results, the fire test results, and a site-based failure modes and effective analysis. So that's uh, the two pieces of information that they will look at in order to allow an installation with cabinets placed side by side, back to back, back to the wall, in a corner, et cetera. So a little more detail, UL 9540A is a very expensive uh, fire test, and all of our lithium battery vendors have tested or plan to test their cabinets to this uh, test method. And the test, if successful, proves that a thermal runaway or a fire in a single battery module, single battery itself, will not propagate to adjacent cabinets or structures in the building uh, under even the worst case conditions. If, however, the client is complying with a previous code like IFC 608, where there's no mention of cabinet spacing for any type of uh, uh, battery chemistry in there, and they're allowed to deploy cabinets just like you see in the uh, picture in the lower right corner. But keep in mind that down the road, eventually your city or location will be adopting the latest fire codes and electrical codes, and for future installations or for extensions to their initial installation, if they're adding batteries and UPSs later, they will probably need to apply. And in most cases, that means the designers are going to plan for that in their initial design of the room, even if they don't yet or haven't yet adopted the latest code. So here's an example of UL 9540A test results. And you can see what's been done here is the test lab has constructed a system with batteries placed side to side and back to back. And they basically set one cabinet uh, battery module on fire, as you can see there, and verified that the flames do not propagate. If you look at the actual report, and again, this is testing conducted by UL, not by the vendor. Highlighted in yellow there, you see things like the results show that no propagation was observed, no external flaming occurred, no flying debris occurred. That sounds good. Uh, no reignition once the fire was initially put out. It shows the temperatures of the uh, storage system uh, cabinet temperature and the wall service or the wall uh, adjacent to that uh, battery cabinet are within those limits. So those kinds of things are what the uh, authority having jurisdiction is going to see that that test has been successfully passed. They're going to waive things like cabinet spacing and maximum allowable quantities. So what the fire code official is going to look for, 
uh, the FMEA analysis uh, by the user may be required to verify the below points. Uh, if they can verify the 600 kilowatt hour maximum allowable quantity or and or the three foot spacing requirements based on FMEA and UL 9540A test results. They're gonna be looking at how much toxic gas would be produced under an emergency situation. Make sure it remains above the IDLH, immediate danger to life or health. Flammable gas, uh, not to exceed 25% of LFL and emitted in normal or abnormal conditions, excuse me, overcharge or over discharge must not result in an explosion based on the gases themselves and the volume of the room where they're located in the ventilation of that room. What's well, not the kind of thing that the vendor can determine themselves, it must be done with the input from the facility itself, the building itself, the room, and the designers of that. So let's take a side note here and say, what is an FMEA analysis if you're not familiar with that? Uh, the analysis may, or it's done by the user, by the user's contractor, may be required for the authority having jurisdiction to verify the below points, and we covered those on the previous slide. The FMEA must be conducted by the user or their designate, and it depends on site-specific condition. That's why the vendor can't do it. it, has to be done in conjunction with the site itself. Now, how do I do it? The formats described in a couple of IEC documents uh, or uh, uh, regulations shown at the bottom part of the slide, but more importantly, MIL Standard 1629A describes exactly how to do an FMEA analysis if it's not something you've done before. Uh, while the battery vendor can't create the analysis themselves, they can format their data to comply with the FMEA format as described in the MIL Standard, and that smooths the process and makes it easier and faster conduct an FMEA, so consult your vendor for that kind of data. Now, one other distinction. A lot of times you just hear the term UL 9540 listing, and I've been talking about a UL 9540A testing. Two different things. The testing is not a listing, doesn't result in a mark on the UPS. It shows how a given battery cabinet performs during a large-scale fire event and verifies no flame propagation. On the right-hand side of the slide, you see the UL 9540 with no A, it is, in fact, a listing. It provides a mark on the product nameplate. It's primarily intended for long backup type installations, not uh, typically traditional UPSs. But if I'm using an energy storage system to support the local utility company or to provide four to eight hours of battery backup for a commercial building, that's where both the battery and the uh, charger and inverter associated with it will fall under a UL 9540 listing. Uh, we do see some different interpretations of that. In some places, California most notably, they have basically decreed uh, in their latest uh, fire codes that UL 9540 listing will be required for a UPS used as a big, long backup energy storage system, or a UPS simply used as a UPS. So that's going to make some significant differences for all of us as we deploy going forward. But the listing is different than the testing. Okay. Sometimes a question will come up, how much heat does this battery reject? How much heat does it throw off? Well, keeping in mind that normally the battery is slow charging like a traditional UPS battery and produces uh, probably less than about 500 BTUs day in and day out. During the time the battery is discharging, the maximum temperature, uh, the maximum BTUs is going to be about 8,900, just as an example from one typical size lithium battery cabinet that we use. So this information is shown on the site. Uh, planning drawings that we looked at earlier in the presentation here. So, we're getting to the end here finally. The key takeaways for installation planning, which is the topic here, the thing to remember, the little rhyme, the AHJ has the final say. So we contact our local AHJ during the site design phase, not afterwards. Get their input as early as possible to ensure their acceptance. Now, keep in mind, first of all, you may not have the same uh, inspector at design stage as you do at the sign-off stage. And it's also somewhat subjective. Your authorities having jurisdiction are going to be careful, especially in these early years and these early uh, installations, and they're going to be looking for as much information as possible so that he or she can be comfortable with the safety and performance of that installation. So that's the kind of thing you want to talk about when you've got the room designed on a piece of paper not after you have it already built and ready to go. 
Verify that your battery vendor can supply those large-scale fire testing results and official report done by a national recognized test laboratory like UL, ETL, whatever, and other information that might be needed for the FMEA. So, don't be shy. Contact your UPS or battery vendor with any questions regarding this process. And keep in mind that we've already seen over the last couple of years a lot of the initial confusion has kind of shaken itself out, and we're all now concentrating on things like the uh, IFC 1206 and an FPA 855, which have similar language, and there's less confusion about which standard do I need to comply to, which listing do I need to have or not. We are consolidating now as an industry around those, and it's going to make it a little more straightforward and a little more cut and dried uh, than it was maybe two or three years ago. But in the end, there is still that subjectivity. The authority having jurisdiction is the one that allows you to waive things like cabinet spacing and maximum allowable quantities and array size and that type of thing. So you definitely want to be aware of that. Uh, uh, and uh, make that contact early on. All right, a couple of other side notes here as we finish up our presentation. The question on how do we recycle these lithium batteries at the end of their life comes up very, very frequently. And as an industry, we've kind of uh, soft pedaled that because we know that these batteries are going to have a 10 to 15 year life in a UPS application. And so we feel that recycling is not going to be something that's going to be, uh, you're going to be dealing with every single day. Uh, but there is, uh, and there exist companies that do recycling and provide recycling services, even for large format lithium batteries, like we're talking about here, might come out of your electric car, for example. And just a little information on how that process works. Uh, it's very similar to valve regulated lead acid batteries. Basically, you tear the batteries apart, separate the plastic and metal and chemicals, electrolyte, things like that as much as you can, and basically melt it down. Uh, when you do that with a lithium battery, the very small amount of actual lithium, 1% to 2% by volume, in a lithium ion battery rises to the top and is simply scraped off and disposed of. The other elements of the battery, the plastics and metals and things like that, are recycled just like we would do with a VRLA battery. And things like copper, uh, and uh, uh, nickel that are used uh, and uh, are expensive to, uh, to mine, for example, in lithium batteries, it's nice to have a recycling process that can reclaim that, uh, that, those valuable uh, elements of the battery and uh, allow them to be reused. And speaking of reusing, we're finding an industry uh, cropping up all of its own in the last four years for Second Life applications. When I wear out a battery in my electric car or in my UPS system, that means its capacity is less than 80% of what it was on day one that I installed that battery. Well, that doesn't mean it's completely worthless. Uh, here's an example of a facility in uh, the Netherlands, uh, Amsterdam uh, Arena, uh, or in Europe, that is, Amsterdam Arena, where uh, the battery vendor uh, partnered with Nissan Automotive and ourselves at Eaton and put together uh, battery backup systems for the critical systems in this arena, throughout the arena. Quite a large battery system, and it's made up entirely of used electric vehicle batteries. And the thing that's important here is those batteries have now been operating successfully in that application for additional six years beyond their 10-year service life in the electric cars. So rather than automatically recycling lithium batteries, we're going to want to be on the lookout for Second Life applications where the user can be basically paid to provide a battery that has value and extended life in other applications, emergency lighting, uh, security systems, backup, and things like that, uh, residential uh, uh, backup for a home uh, or a small business, et cetera, are perfect examples of that. So this is just one. All right. So that brings us to the end of our presentation today, and it looks like we've got a little bit of time uh, for questions and answers. So, Ian, if or Amy, if we can go ahead and turn it over uh, to the folks that do have questions, I'll try to answer them as best I can. Thank you, Ed, for a great presentation. Um, if anybody still has a question, feel free to submit it in the Q and A chat tab. And with that, we'll go to. Our first question um, is UL9540A 
required for UL 9540. But I think it's is a the, part. I believe that would be the yeah. certification required for the test. Right. It's a part of the UL 9540 listing. So in order to achieve the listing, that test, uh, we understand, does need to be passed. The good news is it's also a standalone test that meets the uh, requirements that are specified in the fire code. So in other words, I can use the test results as information for the authority having jurisdiction to allow or make exceptions to uh, uh, requirements in the code. Uh, if I have a full UL 9540A listing, then that incorporates the 9540A testing uh, to the best of our understanding. This is all kind of new to uh, to all of us. Okay. Um, the next one is, would you recommend mixing new and old batteries? And uh, if not, then why? We don't recommend mixing new and old batteries uh, 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 if the age of the battery is more than half its expected life. So in a lithium battery system, if I've got batteries that are over five or six years old already, then I want to be a little careful mixing new batteries in there. Doesn't mean you can't do it. But what happens is when I put a brand new battery, let's say I have one battery in a string that fails. When I put a brand new battery in a string of old batteries, there's a tendency for those old batteries to pull the new battery down to their level. So you wouldn't get the full expected uh, lifetime of that new battery that you just replaced. But this is a somewhat uh, subjective uh, topic. And I would say that if the uh, battery is in the, it is a very general rule, if the battery is in the first half of its service life, the whole battery string, then I can go ahead and mix new and uh, old batteries together. As the battery ages, that becomes uh, less likely that it will provide a, a long-term solution. But uh, at that point, you're fairly close to needing to replace the entire string anyway. What we don't want to see is mixing of different chemistry batteries in the same string. So we don't want to mix valve regulated and uh, lithium batteries. Uh, I can have a room with several UPSs in it. One UPS can have a BRLA battery. The other one can have a lithium battery. That's fine. Watch your limits on max maximum allowable quantities. We definitely don't want to mix different chemistries in the same battery string. Okay, uh, this next question is a little interesting. You may or may not know the answer. Um, is there any requirement for flame or heat detection in the actual cabinet or the room with the fire alarm system? For the actual cabinet itself, if we've passed the UL 9540A uh, test, then that eliminates the need for any kind of detection or suppressant within the cabinet, keeping in mind that every lithium battery cabinet includes a battery management system that checks the temperature inside every single individual battery in that cabinet. So it's going to react and actually take action to disconnect that battery cabinet if anybody even gets close to an overheated condition. So, uh, so that doesn't, or at least precludes the need to put a smoke detector or a heat detector inside the cabinet. Now, inside the battery room or the battery environment, like with valve regulated batteries, smoke detectors are almost always required, and uh, gas detectors, and some battery, uh, some, excuse me, some fire detection and suppression systems do use heat detectors that can be positioned above any piece of equipment that would be most likely to emit the most amount of heat under a, a fire condition. Uh, so inside the cabinet, no need for uh, uh, heat or uh, smoke detection in the room. It's likely they'll need at least uh, smoke detection and a gas uh, detector, similar to what we've done for UPSs for quite a while now. Okay. Then from a UPS point of view, what is the main difference between VRLA and lithium batteries? From a UPS operator's point of view, the biggest difference in, uh, in our discussions with various customers now over the last four years is not necessarily the size and weight reduction, which is nice, but the big difference for them falls back down to money, and that's to do with the uh, double expected service life, whereas we tell clients to budget for battery replacement, complete battery replacement at the five to six year mark of that battery's life. Our uh, typical lithium-ion batteries from ourselves and other UPS vendors have a 10-year uh, 
uh, warranty on the performance of the battery, and the battery vendors uh, expect a full 15 years of service life, which means you might have an installation where the battery actually lasts as long as the UPS does. And that's the big thing that's, uh, that's making a difference for, uh, for UPS customers. So oh, if there's a customer that had uh, an existing UPS system that was originally deployed with lead acid batteries, what items need to be considered if they want to now deploy lithium ion? An excellent question because this comes up very, very frequently. A lot of customers with an existing UPS want to uh, replace those batteries when needed with a lithium ion battery that might last longer or allow them to take up less space and maybe even get more time. Uh, but we can't automatically assume that every UPS is, is workable with a lithium ion battery. So the thing to do is to consult the vendor and say, I've got this model UPS. Can I retrofit a lithium ion battery here? And uh, the answer often is going to be yes. Uh, maybe a firmware change might be needed with the UPS, but uh, from a purely functional and electrical standpoint, uh, that can be done. What is different, though, is that a lot of clients are going to logically hope that I can just take my old battery cabinets or batteries out of my existing cabinet and slide in lithium batteries into that cabinet. And one of the things that's happened in the industry is the lithium vendors don't feel any particular need to make their battery shaped like a traditional car battery or UPS battery which means they're not going to retrofit into an empty shell cabinet. Typically, there are a few that are working in that direction, but we don't have that available yet as a retrofit into the existing cabinet. So if I wanted to retrofit a new lithium battery onto an old UPS, first thing to do is verify the UPS can operate with lithium. And then the next thing to do is probably plan on removing the old battery and its cabinetry and bringing in new lithium batteries in their own cabinets. Good news is they weigh less take up less space. Okay, and then are the same codes still relevant if the batteries are installed outside in a non-lawful? Again, another excellent question. If I go outdoors for installing these batteries, and that's something which should definitely be considered, especially for large installations, because it's a huge amount of footprint, which is valuable, that you can take and put out uh, on a pad out back in a or in a parking lot or something like that. That being said, there are requirements in the same codes we talked about for spacing between fences, exterior walls of buildings, and those type of things that are specific to outdoor installations. Another alternative would be to put together uh, an enclosure uh, that is packed full of uh, lithium batteries, and maybe that enclosure contains a battery charger, and if it's listed to UL9540, meaning it'll have a label on it, then that allows that enclosure to be put almost anywhere outside of the building within certain length limitations and uh, certainly needs to be uh, protected from unauthorized access. But uh, that's what we see as a trend going forward is a lot of these large battery systems are going to be moved outside just because of the benefit and uh, in, in allowing more free space to be used inside the building so they can put more IT equipment and computing and that type of thing in there rather than taking up valuable floor space with batteries. Uh, another question we got here was lithium has been deployed in UPS and data center environments for about five years now. How confident are you in the claims of 10 to 15 year life without having a deployment history of that period of time? Another good question and exactly the question we posed over and over again to the different uh, lithium vendors that we use. Uh, the, uh, they showed us some data and we did our own testing, extensive testing that took six months to a year per battery vendor at a time to make sure that we feel comfortable that they can uh, operate for as long as they say. Uh, and that's hard to do without taking 10 years to do it. Uh, but we do have uh, methods and the industry has methods of accelerated life testing that give us a good indication that the batteries are gonna perform as the vendor says. Uh, the battery manufacturers position is that they're designing these batteries for 15 years of life in a UPS application, which means a fair number of charge discharge cycles over that life. So our question to the battery manufacturers are, so you feel like you can run 10 years, do you really feel like that in your heart of hearts? 
And their answer is yes. And so we say, well, how do you feel in your warranty of warranties? Well, that's 10 years. So good news is 15 years is probably the maximum expected life, but they feel very comfortable and our testing supports that they can make it. However, we're advising clients on when to budget for lithium battery replacement. We're using that 10 year mark, at least for now, until we all have lots of experience and lots of time under our belt with successful 10 year applications. I would say that we do have uh, several lithium installations that have been functioning for 10 years and continue to function well to this day. So that's a good sign. That's only a very few installations that we can say you're 10 years old or older. Okay. Um, at what power rating would you say lithium ion batteries become more feasible when compared to VRLA batteries? Well, if we take into account the fact they're probably going to have a better service life than uh, a valve regulated battery, whether it's a little UPS or a big UPS, one of the big benefits uh, for smaller rack mount size UPSs where we see lithium batteries becoming more and more prevalent is they do save size and most especially save weight, which is great news for installers and that type of thing. So we have good acceptance, as do our competitors, on uh, uh, UPSs starting as low as uh, 500 watts uh, and going up to uh, uh, maybe 5 kW in a rack type environment with uh, lithium battery, one that's optimized for the safest chemistry, uh, for example. Uh, and then when we move up to uh, 50 kilowatts in three phase UPSs and above, again, the uh, service life and floor space uh, reductions begin to be very compelling. And what most customers ask us to do for those larger UPSs, say from 50 kW on up to as big as they get, is to do a total cost of ownership analysis. What if I started off with a VRLA battery? What if I started off with a lithium ion battery? What would be my lifetime cost over 15 years? Well, the traditional battery would have to be replaced at year five and year 10. So lithium battery would get replaced only at year 10 and would still have capacity left at the end of the time frame, et cetera. So those kind of analysis we can help our clients do as our competitors can to get a good long view of uh, what the benefits are. So to answer the question, it's not really a firm lower limit on where lithium makes sense. We're having a lot of traction with uh, 700, 1500 watt UPSs that go in a rack with lithium batteries, uh, as well as the giant UPS systems at uh, 500, 1000, 1500 kW, uh, where uh, almost 30% of our new installations are going in with lithium. Okay, and then the last question I have for you states that lithium polymer has an energy density advantage but lithium iron phosphate is known to tolerate more abuse. So do you see any trends favoring one chemistry over the other? The information in that question is exactly correct. We do see uh, the better uh, tolerance to thermal abuse for uh, lithium iron phosphate. Uh, early on in the process, it appeared that was going to be uh, going to come at almost a prohibitive uh, expense increase. However, that has not proven to be the, fa uh, the fact. So uh, we are uh, very, uh, uh, we're very, uh, uh, what do I want to say, very pro lithium iron phosphate, especially for smaller UPSs, but it also works for the larger ones. And that's the choice to use when we have a situation where I absolutely must have the safest possible lithium chemistry for my application. There are cases where a uh, lithium uh, uh, a lithium polymer battery might provide a little better energy density, for example, uh, thus smaller footprint, fewer cabinets to be procured or whatever. But there's no longer a huge difference in the viability of those, either one of those for a UPS application. Whereas four years ago, I would have said, well, maybe we might lean toward one chemistry or the other. Today, my answer is both of those chemistries work well. And the differences in performance between those two are uh, relatively small nowadays. Well, that's all the time we have for questions today. So please join me in thanking Ed Spears for his presentation, as well as our sponsor, Eaton. If you have any additional questions or comments, click the email us button on the console. And as you exit today's webinar, please take a couple of minutes to complete our survey. 
We strongly welcome your detailed comments. Please visit www.missioncriticalmagazine.com slash webinars for the archive of this presentation, as well as information about our upcoming events. We appreciate your time and hope you have found this webinar to be a valuable experience.